fluidity of reality. And we tend to think about reality as something that is fixed and and real in that it's immutable or um, unassailable. But uh, we're we're going to talk about how quickly our experience of reality can shift. So it should be a fun conversation, but before we get started, let's take a minute or two to get present. Let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clean, crisp oxygen flooding your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing all your cells, all your organs, bringing vital life energy to your body and being. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant, bright light lighting you up from the inside out, illuminating, electrifying, and energizing all your cells, all your molecules, your electrons, creating a brilliant beam of light and energy from your heart out into the world. And as you exhale, exhale any remaining tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's press our palms together. Vigorously rub your hands together to feel the friction, the temperature, the pressure, the motion, the tickling and tingling when you stop. And allow all those sensations to bring you present right here, right now, into this remarkable physical form that enables us to experience life. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So uh, we are talking about the fluidity or the malleability of reality. And um, I think... We don't we don't interact with reality as uh, as it relates to its mutability. But um, what I what I've noticed in the work in the literal thousands of sessions that I have done with clients is that our our reality, our experience of reality, our emotionality, our experience of the circumstances of our of our lives can shift on a dime. And I I've seen so 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 many times how people coming into a session in breakdown, in tears, like the world's coming to an end. Um, like they just don't know how to contend with a particular circumstance and, and, um, just in breakdown and by the end of a session, which is 90 minutes, typically that upset is gone and they're doing well. And how can that be? How can that be if reality is something that's fixed? If reality is something that is some kind of absolute within which we reside. So it's it's an interesting thing to see from from my experience to witness again and again and again how malleable, how fluid, how changeable reality is our experience of it. Because we would we would start out saying, well, the reality is this, 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 and this. And then after a session and some communication with your own other than conscious intelligence or a reframing of certain things or releasing some kind of trauma from the past, 
all of a sudden we're free to be able to perceive something in a very different way. And I'm not talking about reality with a capital R because I don't know that we actually have any access to that. Um, and the reason I say that is that we have all these beliefs, behaviors, filters, patterns, conditioning through which we perceive, literally perceive the world and thereby experience the world. And so many of these filters, behaviors, beliefs, patterns <coughs> are driven by things that we were indoctrinated to or programmed to when we were children. And as children, we just received that information as truth, as reality. And um, often it was just never questioned because it didn't occur to us to question whether whether it was true or not, because that was given to us as the foundation of our experience. And so we live then from that space, like little kids growing up emotional and being told you're too much or, or you're not good enough or you're not smart or you're too this, that, or the other thing. And we absorb these things and we accept these things as truths. And then we live life from that truth, often without questioning it, because it's invisible to us. It's just the water we swim in. It's just the way things are. And uh, we're taught these kinds of things with religion as well, you know, we're indoctrinated from a very young age and taught what to believe. And so when these, these beliefs and even traumas, you know, in, in, the, in the situation of trauma, we make decisions often as little children trying to cope with certain dangers in life, certain traumatic circumstances, uh, we make decisions about how life is at an early age without any awareness that we're making that decision. And then that decision from a five-year-old dictates the rest of our lives somehow. So for instance, a child in a in a volatile emotional situation where it could be dangerous to be seen or heard or to speak their mind, that child learns to disappear, to be invisible, to fade into the background, to not express, uh, perhaps, as an example. And so then growing up in the world, that person still is maintaining that behavior that was their salvation as a child. And then as an adult, it doesn't work for them so well because they're, they're being passed over for opportunities or they're finding a deep dissatisfaction in life itself, in the quality of their lives, because they're not expressed they're they're locked within themselves when that young child gets released and gets the nurturance that that child needs which is something that is quite possible even though that's the past we'll talk about that in a second um then all of a sudden the trauma in the moment that is reminiscent of that original upset kind of takes on a whole new perspective when when that child can feel safe uh, the the adult then has a different perspective and 
when we talk about the fluidity of reality and the and the um, malleability of reality and time, uh, this is something else that I've seen thousands of times where we we believe the past is unchangeable. The past is just something that's a fixed reality. However, the past actually resides right here right now if i the the past exists in so far as i create it again in this moment or as it is created again and again in this moment and we can see this we can see the malleability of the past and the experience of the past just in the changing of our history as we start to more broadly include stories of people in of color and indigenous people in our history so the heroes that we had historically we can identify now in many cases as villains or certainly not as untarnished heroes in the way that they had been previously re represented you know there are new heroes there's new information that we learn about history and it changes the current response you know when we when we discover something new about perhaps human origins you know it shifts the way that we relate to our current experience and so that's what i mean when i say the past only exists in the present insofar as the the impact and the power that we give it the interesting thing is that we often don't recognize the impacts of our past interpretations in our present moment and so we don't recognize how the five-year-old who was traumatized is running the show until we're able to uncover that and recognize that that past has been dragged along that interpretation that that experience has been dragged along into this moment and we do then have the ability to transform that past by and by the magic of our minds that doesn't distinguish something vividly imagined from something actually experienced. And so if we can go back to a traumatic moment in time and recreate that and resolve it in a different way, then what happens is the impact of that resolution bubbles up into the present moment relieving all these associations that were so tightly woven together that they looked like reality good morning good morning is that dido or sue popping in as enlightened world network so good to have you joining us so when we look at our lives and interpret them as unchanging or uh, situations that are irreconcilable or we look at things like that's just the way things are it is our interpretation that we are imposing on whatever the isness is that's out there to say that's how things are things are the way that we perceive them at least in our own experience and we we are the center of our own universes you know we are the creators consciously or otherwise of our experience and so while so many of these interpretations of life and reality and circumstance and inner the interactions that we have while 
so many of those experiences seem to be one way. The fascinating and profoundly freeing thing is to recognize that by a shift of mind, by a shift of point of view, the perception also can shift and often with with great degree radically things can shift radically so for example we can experience something that we had previously interpreted as a devastation as a destructive tragic even crisis even kind of experience we can then come to experience it as one of the greatest gifts of our lives in the awakening that it provided us and we can go from a space, for instance, of victimhood to a space of empowerment, just like that, just like that. We have phenomenally agile minds and being, phenomenally agile. And so what this brings home to me, seeing it again and again and again and again and again, what it brings home to me is that we do get to engage in a conscious way in the creation of our reality and of our experience. And we can generate a number of questions that can support us in moving in that direction and, and attitudes that can support us in really actively creating a life of greater fulfillment. And so one of the questions we spoke about yesterday is what would love do? That's a super powerful question. Uh, another question uh, or attitude actually to cultivate is one of curiosity, curiosity without judgment. When we give ourselves curiosity, what we do is we open ourselves to possibility and potential. And we also relieve ourselves of judgment. So one of my favorite sayings is curiosity is the antidote to judgment. So to get curious, like what would I have to think? What would I have to believe to feel that way? And this is a way that we can unearth some of our invisible operating system, our invisible beliefs, that then we can excavate further. So it may be as a child in a traumatic environment, we learn that people are dangerous or men are dangerous or women are dangerous or any number of other things we make these determinations or are given gifted these determinations, but often as very young, impressionable children. And we don't even know that we've received that, that programming. We don't even know that we've received that conditioning. But with curiosity, we can look at that and say, okay, so what's what's going on there? Here I had this very, very difficult situation. We can then, as adults, 
go back to that wounded child and provide that child with what they need, the nurturance they need, the sense of, of someone there with them. We can actually go back as an adult, and this is such a, it, it, such a powerful and simple process to witness oneself in a, in a difficult, difficult situation and to go back as the adult and say, what do you need? What can I give you? How can I support you? Ourselves talking to ourselves. So our more, more seasoned, more mature, hopefully wiser self going back to presence yourself to the child in a way that is nurturing to them, that provides them with the assurance that they make it through, first of all, and, and that they're not alone. And the miracles of that kind of support and camaraderie cannot be under, um, cannot be overstated. It's something that powerful and so simple that we can do for ourselves to go back and just give love to ourselves, give support to ourselves, give protection to ourselves, to be able to shift a dynamic wherein certain decisions were made, certain attitudes were adopted and to allow the the need for that to shift and what happens is it's like dominoes that that change populates up and bubbles up and percolates up into the present moment changing our experiences throughout time and it's it's really quite extraordinary and somewhat boggling that something so simple can make such a profound difference because it's existing where in our imagination. But the thing is, our imagination is so is the way we live through life for the most part. We're imagining the world into existence. We're imagining that you are a certain way, that I am a certain way, that that it's if I if I believe that people are dangerous, I'm imagining that into reality and projecting it forward, then living into it as if it were true. And thereby creating that circumstance over and over and over, validating it. So it's not, if we look at our lives and we look at these determinations that we make and we say, yeah, but here's evidence and here's evidence and here's evidence. Of course, there's evidence. If I'm taught as a child that I'm a failure and I take that on knowingly or otherwise, generally not knowingly. I take it on that that's who I am. I accept that I am a failure. Then of course, as a failure, I need to create failure in my life over and over and over again to validate and to be in alignment with that identity. And so when I can then go back and say, wait a second, that's not actually the truth. And I can communicate with that child self to say, wait a second, these projections of failure, they're not about you. They're about the source of the projection. That's a judgment coming from something else. It's not about you. It's coming from somebody else's perception, somebody else's inadequacy, a projection of their own inadequacy. 
where they are creating certain standards or whatever by which to make these assessments. And it's their own sense of failure that they're projecting forward onto a child. So, you know, we talk about genetic inheritance, but we have behavioral inheritance as well. We have emotional inheritance as well, we, where we're taught to react to certain things in certain ways. We're taught how to be. And when we begin to be able to start exposing these invisible premises, I say invisible because they're so integrated within us because we embody them then we begin our path to freedom from that kind of oppression that kind of programming those limitations those those false constraints so by recognizing that reality is fluid it opens up a choice of, well, what do I truly prefer? And that's another wonderful question to be operating with is, what am I feeling? What can I notice about it? Be curious. And what might I prefer? And then what needs to shift in order to create that preferred state? So... That's it for today. I'm Mira Rubin. This is The Core Connection. And I go live here each weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern on the Enlightened World Network Facebook page and YouTube channel. And I invite you to please like, follow, and share Enlightened World Network and me. The links are in the description. And as always, it's a tremendous pleasure and privilege to have the opportunity to have these morning musings together on what it is to be human. So until next time, so much love to you.